welcome to How to Fix It. Star Trek Beyond came out yesterday, or today, if you're watching this on Patreon, and next year we're getting a new Star Trek TV series. So it looks like Star Trek is finally back on its feet. 2006 to 2008 was a weird time for Star Trek. For the first time in almost 20 years, there was nothing new from Star Trek. The film franchise had basically gone into hibernation after the abysmal failure of Nemesis, and Enterprise was cancelled just as it was getting good. At the time, it seemed like Star Trek was done. Now, obviously, you can't keep a good Starfleet officer down, and Star Trek is so iconic that it's never going to truly end. Although, the most iconic form of Star Trek is the original series, so it's not at all surprising what Paramount ended up doing. I think you'd be hard-pressed to find someone who doesn't at least kinda know about Star Trek. At least the original series. Yeah, they can't quote it, but they know the basic stuff. Kirk, Spock, McCoy, Captain's Log, etc. They know what a Klingon is, and they know that the guy in the red shirt always dies. Unless he's Scotty, who is known for giving her all she's got, Captain. So it seems almost logical that in 2009, we got another Star Trek movie, which instead of pulling from the rich universe of the post-Voyager years, or taking us to another unseen chapter of Starfleet's history, like the Earth-Romulan War, Paramount decided to refresh the franchise by rebooting it. Yeah, I know, it's not technically a reboot because alternate timeline, but whatever, it's a reboot. In 2009, we were given a new Star Trek movie featuring the crew from the original series, played by new actors. It was an ambitious idea, and the concept of recasting the original roles isn't inherently a bad idea. Hell, Harv Bennett wanted to do that back in 1989, an idea which got scrapped and replaced with The Undiscovered Country. Not a bad trade, admittedly, but it is something that could have been interesting. Keyword, could have. Star Trek, open bracket, 2009, closed bracket, is not a good movie. At least in my opinion. And it's not the concept that's bad, but the way it was executed that made it bad. Anyway, I'm rambling, and I'm gonna get into my problems later, so let's get right to it and look at Star Trek, open bracket, 2009, closed bracket. The movie opens up in 2233, and the USS Kelvin is going about its business when some manner of vortex opens up and a large black ship emerges, which immediately starts firing. The black ship, piloted by Romulans, demands that the captain of the Kelvin, Captain Robau, goes over to their ship, the Narada, via shuttle, to negotiate a ceasefire. Robau goes over, leaving his first officer, George Kirk, in command of the ship. The Romulan captain, Nero, first asks about an Ambassador Spock, but Rabau isn't familiar with him and then requests to know the year. And upon discovering that it is 2233, he kills Rabau and attacks the Kelvin. Kirk evacuates the ship, including his pregnant wife, Winona, who, due to the stress involved with the attack, goes into labor, and in his final moments, Kirk manages to help his wife pick out a name for their son, James Tiberius Kirk, before being forced to crash the Kelvin into the Narada manually due to the failure of the autopilot to ensure that the escaping shuttles aren't destroyed by Nero. And then, sometime in the 2240s, the car chase happens. I'm not even dignifying this scene with a summary, because someone on the movie decided to edit out all context from this scene, therefore having it mean jack all to the rest of the movie, and be extraneous. But, there is a scene with Spock as a child beating up another kid on Vulcan for calling his human mother a whore. And then, after admonishing him for losing emotional control, Sarek tells Spock that only he can decide his destiny when Spock tells him of his issues with being Vulcan and human at the same time. An older Spock is later conflicted about whether or not to undergo the Kolinar ritual, and his mother tells him that she'll be proud of him either way. Even later still, Spock is accepted into the Vulcan Science Academy, but declines when they insult his half-human heritage and goes to join Starfleet. In 2255, James T. Kirk is sitting in a bar in Riverside when he meets Starfleet Cadet Uhura, who is studying linguistics, and he unsuccessfully tries to pick her up, leading to a confrontation with several other cadets, including Hendorf, who Kirk nicknames Cupcake before getting the crap kicked out of him by said cadets, prior to Captain Christopher Pike breaking the fight up and sitting down to talk with Kirk. 
He tells Kirk about his admiration for Kirk's father and how he believes Kirk has... That instinct to leap without looking, that was his nature too, and in my opinion, some Starfleet's lost. Keep that stored away to remember for the next movie, because that's going to be important. He tells Kirk to join Starfleet, and Kirk decides to sign up, saying that he'll make it through the Academy in three years. He gets on the shuttle of the Academy and meets Dr. Leonard McCoy, who is joining Starfleet as he's just went through a pretty bad divorce. Then we cut to three years later where Kirk is about to take the Kobayashi Maru test for the third time. But before he does, he's got to sleep with a green woman because of course he does, because that's the Kirk stereotype. But he also manages to hear about an escape from a Klingon prison before Yahura, who happens to be the roommate of the Orion girl, kicks him out, but not before Kirk watches her get undressed. He takes the test while acting like a prick and wins it, despite it being a no-win scenario because he reprogrammed the test the night before. And while the original Kirk got a commendation for original thinking, this Kirk gets a hearing in front of a disciplinary board. But before they can rule, Vulcan starts having an environmental disaster, and they mobilize the fleet, drafting all eligible cadets and packing the ships up. Kirk can't go because of the hearing, but McCoy gets him on board using the slapstick vaccine to give Kirk the symptoms of slapstick so he can treat him on board the Enterprise. They get on board, and Pike meets his new helmsman, Hikaru Sulu, and new navigator, Pavel Chekhov. Spock, his first officer, shows up, and the fleet prepares to head for Vulcan, but the Enterprise is delayed since Sulu forgot to disengage the parking brake. I wish I were kidding. During the delay, Kirk hears about a lightning storm and races to find Yahura and takes her to the bridge, as that transmission she intercepted about the escaped prisoners from Rura Penth is directly connected to Vulcan's problems, as the lightning storm was the event directly preceding the Kelvin's showdown with Nero. They make it to Vulcan and the entire fleet is seemingly destroyed, and Vulcan getting a giant hole drilled into it. Nero recognizes the Enterprise and hails Pike, demanding that he goes by shuttle to negotiate, and Pike relents, leaving Spock in command and Kirk as first officer, and orders Kirk and Sulu down to destroy the mining platform. They do that, but they're too late, and Nero drops in red matter, which begins to tear Vulcan apart. Kirk and Sulu begin to fall, but they are saved from midair drop by Chekhov, who can apparently operate the transporters. Spock beams down to save his parents and the Vulcan elders, but as they're beaming up, the ground underneath Amanda, Spock's mother, gives way and she falls to her death. Too bad the guy operating the transporters didn't just prove he could transport fallen people. Vulcan is eaten by a black hole, and Spock attempts to get past the death of his mother, while keeping command and figures that Nero's from the future. Kirk wants to get Pike back, who is still on the Narada, but Spock wants to meet with the rest of the fleet. Spock orders Kirk removed from the bridge, and when he fights back, Spock nerve pinches him and shoots him out an escape pod and leaves him on a planet named Delta Vega. A seeming nod to the ore mining planet from the second pilot of the original series, except it can't be the same planet because they have entirely different appearances. Nero asks Pike for defense codes, but Pike refuses to give them to him. He asks why Nero destroyed Vulcan, and he says that he lost his wife and unborn son when Romulus was destroyed. Pike tells him that Romulus wasn't destroyed, but he doesn't take it that well. I watched it happen! I saw it happen! Don't tell me it didn't happen! Nero also puts a slug in the Pike's throat because the filmmakers are ripping off a better Star Trek movie. Kirk wakes up and escapes from two giant monsters before being saved by Spock, the Leonard Nimoy Spock, or as the toy line for the movie calls him, Original Spock. A pretty apt name if you ask me. Ambassador Spock is shocked that Kirk found him, but Kirk doesn't really know him and is confused when Ambassador Spock refers to him as a friend, when Kirk and his Spock are definitely not. Ambassador Spock mind melts with Kirk to info dump about his predicament, and Kirk learns that in 2387 the Hobish star goes supernova and threatens to destroy Romulus. Ambassador Spock is sent to pilot a ship, the Jellyfish, and use red matter to create a black hole that would stop the supernova. It worked, though not quick enough in Romulus. Romulus was destroyed. Nero, a particularly troubled Romulan, intercepted Spock, and in the attack they were both dragged into the black hole. Nero emerged earlier, destroying the Kelvin and was taken prisoner by Klingons, and Spock emerged during the lightning storm that Pike mentioned earlier, being captured by Nero and marooned on Delta Vega to watch Vulcan's destruction. Ambassador Spock knows that they need to get Kirk back to the Enterprise, and goes in search for the only person with the ability to get him there, Montgomery Scott, who is stationed on Delta Vega for losing Admiral Archer's Beagle. 
He gives Scotty the transwarp beaming equation that the James Dew and Scotty came up with in the future, which allows Spock to beam Kirk and Scotty to the Enterprise. And Ambassador Spock tells Kirk to emotionally compromise Commander Spock so that Kirk can take command and stop Nera. Kirk and Scotty are sent over, and Kirk emotionally compromises Spock, getting nearly strangled to death in the process. Kirk assumes command and sets off to catch the Narada. They hide behind Titan so Nero won't detect them, and Spock comes back and volunteers to beam over the Nero ship to retrieve the Red Matter, and Kirk decides to go to save Pike as well. They go over just as Nero begins drilling into the Pacific Ocean. Kirk and Spock find the jellyfish, and Spock learns of the ship's origins in the future, and that the only registered pilot is himself, and Kirk tells him to fly it out while he searches for Pike. Nero tries to follow and destroy the jellyfish, but Spock decides to do what George Kirk did and rams his ship into the Narada, so that the Red Matter detonation would take out the Narada. Nero tries to fire, but the Enterprise shows up and destroys all their weapons, so Spock can finish his plan. Kirk finds Pike and prepares to leave, and Spock, Pike, and Kirk are beamed back right before the jellyfish collides with the Narada. The Red Matter generates a black hole, and Nero begins to be sucked in, and Kirk offers assistance, which Nero refuses. So the Enterprise blows him up, and the Enterprise narrowly escapes the black hole. Back at Earth, Spock meets with his older self, who tells him that he should stay in Starfleet, since Ambassador Spock will handle helping the Vulcans establish a colony and rebuild their race. Kirk is given the Enterprise, Pike is promoted to Admiral, and the entire gang starts off on their first mission together, as the movie ends with Ambassador Spock reading the famous opening narration. A lot of the actors actually do really well for the recasting. Pike didn't have all that much development in his two appearances in TOS, and Greenwood definitely gives us a different, less internalized Pike, who is definitely the product of a much different Starfleet than the original. Anton Yelchin also did a spectacular job as Chekhov, and is one of the best cast characters of the movie. Carl Urban is a great McCoy, and even Leonard Nimoy himself loved the performance. Urban just has that same old country doctor vibe that DeForest Kelly had. Zachary Quinto's Spock is different, but I can't say that it's bad. It's not quite what Nimoy did, but it works. Simon Pegg's Scotty is essentially perfect casting, since he's exactly what I imagined a younger Scotty would be. I mean, the Scotty in TOS was in his 40s, so he was an experienced and very focused engineer. And this Scotty is a more irresponsible one, seeing as how he tested transwarp beaming on a very important living being. John Cho doesn't do a bad job as Sulu, but maybe because I've seen him in other movies, I wasn't all that impressed with his performance. Zoe Saldana is okay as Yohura, but they just don't give her all that much to do. So for what she does do, she does it very well, and is a very good actress when she's playing people like Gamora from Guardians of the Galaxy. And I would be remiss if I neglected to mention Leonard Nimoy, and his presence in the movie definitely legitimizes the film for me, and in some aspects saves the movie. The reason why is that Leonard Nimoy, according to William Shatner's book Leonard, was the most protective of his character. And so if he agreed to do this movie when he refused to do Generations because Spock's role was so trivial it could have been given to Scotty, which it was, he must have thought this movie had some reason to exist. So, on that merit, the movie works. I also love the ship designs. Not the interiors, but the exteriors. They look amazing. Sure, I'm always going to prefer the original design of the Enterprise, but I like that they kept the round nacelles, even if they just look like round versions of the refit design and don't have any of the orange in it. The Narada looks awesome, too. According to the prequel comic, it's based on Borg and Romulan technology massed together, and it's just so cool looking. The music is also really good. Michael Giacchino manages to get some really good music in there, and uses little stings and callbacks to Alexander Courage's original Star Trek theme. I also appreciate that a lot of the background sounds in the movie are what we heard in the background on TOS. 
In fact, I'd go so far to say that they're probably ripped directly from there. I mean, it's distracting as all hell with the Apple Eye Enterprise interiors, giving off sounds that reek of the 60s kitsch that Abrams himself said he was trying to avoid, but I dig it. The effects are good, too. I mean, it's hard not to appreciate the action scenes, even if I feel like they aren't the type of action scenes that belong in a Star Trek movie. I also really liked how they explained away a possible continuity error. See, in TOS, Starfleet didn't use the Delta symbol for the entire fleet. It was solely the Enterprise's assignment patch. The Antares had a shell-looking one, Defiant had a pennant, Starfleet Command had a flower, and so on. It's been implied that because the Enterprise was present for so many major events, first contacts, battles, etc., that sometime after the Enterprise returned from the five-year mission, Starfleet adopted their assignment packs for everyone, since they were basically the face of Starfleet. Now, in this movie, we're never shown any other assignment packs, just the Delta one that even the Kelvin uses. That could have been an issue, but it's not. Because if you think about it, it makes complete sense. In the Prime Universe, the Kelvin has that patch, has an unremarkable mission, and returns home. Then Starfleet reuses the patch for the Enterprise. In the Kelvin timeline, Nero attacks, Kelvin is destroyed. Starfleet adopts the symbol on the Kelvin in tribute and solidarity for the casualties of Nero's attack. I doubt that was intentional, but it's cool either way. Oh, and most of the stuff involving Spock is really good. Kirk's a jackass, but Spock definitely gets the better end of the deal in the story. Sure, his planet is destroyed, but Spock is developed, and we get a reconciliation of him and his father years before Prime Spock and Sarek did. It's just a shame that Amanda had to die for that to happen. Kirk's story is cut to pieces, but Spock stays pretty intact, and his story is good, with him dealing with the two halves of his being, and actually finding a balance without needing to undergo a mind meld with V'ger. Other than that, I don't have much else to say. Live long and prosper. We'll be right back. Peace and long life. We're back. First of all, Nero has no motivation. Yes, in the Countdown comic, they give him motivation. But Roberto Orsi has said that it's not canon when asked how a ship from the future with Borg technology wasn't able to destroy the Kelvin and the Enterprise immediately with no resistance. So if the guy who made it said it wasn't canon, why should I bother with considering it canon? Plus, since the movie was made to appeal to the lowest common denominator, only Star Trek fans are going to read the comic anyway, and not the random moviegoer that the movie was trying to appeal to. So most people aren't going to to know his motivation aside from my wife and son died in the future so I'm angry in the past about it. In the comic, it's shown that he put a lot of trust in Spock to help save his people, so when Spock failed, he snapped. Because if he hadn't trusted and helped Spock, he would have been able to save his wife and unborn son. So by using that, Nero is a pretty compelling villain and goes from Kylo Ren into Khan Light. But, since it might not be canon, his motivation as stated in the movie sucks. Which brings me to my next point. Nero is an idiot and his plan is friggin' stupid. Why doesn't he, upon figuring out that he's in 2233, go straight to Romulus, give them the Narada, and say, hey, in 250 years or so, Hobus is going to go Nova, so be prepared for that. Sure, they might not believe him, but if he's so bent on destroying the Federation and the Vulcans, use the Narada to make the Romulans more powerful. I mean, that's bad for Starfleet, but good for him. Hell, if he's so bent on revenge for the death of his people, save them! Research time travel and friggin' use it! The slingshot effect that they used in Star Trek IV was discovered by accident, so I'm pretty sure that you'd figure it out if you devoted 20 or so years to time travel research. The Romulans in the book from last week figured it out, so I can't imagine that Nero couldn't. Take the Narada around the sun, and since it's pretty imprecise and used for mainly traveling to approximately where you want to go, he might actually end up there with enough time to properly warn Romulus before the Nova starts. And hell, he can even warn the younger Nero and evacuate his family. I mean, 
by destroying the Kelvin, he basically ensured that he could never go back to his Romulus ever again, because he's the reason his Romulus won't exist. And the story of the film as a whole is pretty damn weak. Not help that they cut out a lot of stuff that would have saved it. Having Kirk's uncle slash stepdad appear without context makes Kirk seem like a jerk for stealing the car. But with the context that Kirk's uncle slash stepdad was possibly abusing his mother and planning to sell George Kirk's antique car, which is probably the last thing that Kirk and his brother have left of George, makes Kirk out to be trying to protect his father's memory, even if he ended up sending it careening off a cliff anyway. Oh, and I'm not too big a fan of Chris Pine's Kirk. I don't know why, but until one of the recent trailers for Beyond, I didn't get a Kirk vibe from Pine, like, at all. He just didn't feel like Kirk. On the subject of Kirk, they turned Kirk into a sleazy pervert. And I know what you're thinking, that Kirk was like that in the original series. But if you said that, then you've never actually seen an episode of the original series, or you've only seen the crappy ones. James Tiberius Kirk would probably be a feminist. Not that he'd call himself that because there'd be no need for that word in the future because humanity is awesome. I, I mean, just this one line basically proves my point. He's human. Down to the last blood cell, she's human. Down to the last thought, hope, aspiration, emotion, she's human. But the human spirit is free. You have no power. Of ownership. And Kelvin timeline Kirk gropes Uhura's breasts and watches her change. That whole Kirk acting exactly like Zap Brannigan stereotype is wrong. I know Kirk did get all the women mostly, but he wasn't a sleaze bag. Most of the women that he had relationships with were women that meant something to him. I mean, Edith Keeler, Miramani, even Reyna from that clip, who meant so much to him that Spock apparently used a mind meld to make Kirk forget about Reyna so he could move on. Maybe you can argue that those values were instilled in him by his father, so that's why he's like this, but I personally think it's kind of disgraceful to the legacy of the character. The ending is also really weak. Kirk just becomes captain? Did the destruction of the fleet at Vulcan really cripple Starfleet? Because there is no way Kirk deserves the chair after that. Hell, the first part of In the Darkness is about how he's not mature enough to be captain. Like I said in my top 15 The Original Series episodes list, Prime Kirk, as I'll refer to him as a way to distinguish him from Kelvin Kirk, went to the Academy, got tormented by Finnegan, served on the Republic with Finney, the Farragut with Captain Garavik, then eventually became captain of the Enterprise. This Kirk wasn't given the assignments that turned a possibly immature jerk into the unflappable Horatio Hornblower in space that we came to know. Oh, and before anyone says that in the comments, yeah, the lens flare was dumb. Fun fact, when I was looking up clips of this movie on YouTube for stuff to splice in, sometimes I couldn't tell if it was crap quality or if the movie just looked bad on its own. I hate the costumes, too. I, I can't tell why, but they just look bad. I think it's the material with all the little Delta symbols, because while it's cool from a fashion standpoint, it doesn't make sense from a military standpoint. There's just no reason for it. Also, the ship interiors look way too clean for me. Like, even TNG with, with all its touchscreen panels still had actual buttons. And the bridge design is crap. It's like, the view screen should not be a window, because that's just giving the bad guys a big frickin' target to aim at. Most of all, I think this lacks the spirit of Star Trek. Even the tagline was, this is not your father's Star Trek. But I like my father's Star Trek. My father's Star Trek was optimistic and showed what humanity could be, not a stock action movie that's designed to appeal to everyone instead of letting Trek's message appeal to everyone. Star Trek has an audience. You don't need to worry about people who just want an action movie. Make good Star Trek first and worry about everything else later. If it's not good Star Trek, it's not worth making.
use Harv Bennett's idea. You don't need to use the exact parameters, but Harv Bennett's Starfleet Academy movie idea has a lot in common with these movies anyway. The first meeting of the Enterprise crew. They can recast the actors and only really need one living actor from the original to tie it all together. I don't know the licensing stuff, but it could work if it could have been arranged. Just have Spock give the speech that transitions into the flashback instead of McCoy. It even has the whole gang getting united. Sure, it'd be weird for the sequels if the Enterprise crew kept crossing paths and never served together until TOS started, but still, the idea of a reboot isn't a bad idea for most franchises. I just hate that it's an entirely new universe that gets rid of all the canon of Star Trek. Star Wars didn't reboot itself, so I don't think Star Trek should do it either. But, if they were trying to divorce themselves from canon, Nero was not the way to do it. I'd have preferred a full reboot, blank slate, rather than the alternate timeline bullcrap, because that just confuses the canon more. As much as I hate reboots, this movie would have worked better if it was more of a reboot, because now we have to find a way to reconcile what the hell happened to people who existed pre-Kelvin in TOS, but not the Kelvin timeline movies, like Finney and Gary Mitchell and Matt Decker, plus what's going to happen to the casts of Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, and Voyager. I would have also kept in Kirk's subplots, definitely explaining how his life was changed without his father there to inspire him. Plus, I wouldn't have ignored Kirk's older brother and showed him as well. The ongoing comics showed him ending up at the Deneva colony after running away from home, so losing not only his father, but his brother as well, who in the prime timeline Kirk established as being one of his closest relatives, would have framed Kirk in a better light in the film. I also would have given Nero better motivation. Star Trek doesn't need another revenge-driven villain. We had Khan, we had Shinzon. Maybe give us another bad guy like Cruz or General Chang, who wants to destroy peace, or hell, someone in it for his own benefit like Soren. Hell, I'd take another cosmic threat like V'ger or the Whale Probe. I'm just sick and tired of revenge-driven villains. Seeing as how In the Darkness had yet another revenge-driven villain, and while I'm not sure about Beyond yet, since I'm not going to see it until after this video goes up, but Crawl looks like another revenge-driven villain. I just want something different. I'd have just made a good Star Trek movie. Nothing more, nothing less. The problem is that the movie was a stock action movie, and admittedly it was a pretty good action movie, but you could have replaced all the characters with non-Star Trek people, and the movie wouldn't have been any different, meaning that having it be Star Trek is pointless. Maybe they could have shown a mission early on from Kirk's five-year mission to show how they got to be the close-knit crew who were united in life and death together. Something to tie it into canon so that as a Star Trek movie, it can expand the Trek narrative and not just be nice to look at. And that was Star Trek. It's said that no one hates Star Trek more than Star Trek fans, and I think that's true. I just want Star Trek to show humanity's potential again, and show a more optimistic future, since the present we're living in is as craptastic as the Cold War was in the 60s, and I want something that I can look forward to. Make your action movies, but if you're going to do one with Star Trek, you need to have a good story aside from the action, like Star Trek II and First Contact. Give us a new type of villain and a better story, and maybe this movie wouldn't be so hated by the fans, or so hated by me at least. I'm just hoping that Beyond will achieve the same success that Star Trek II did after kicking Abrams upstairs like they did to Gene Roddenberry. And that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more of How to Fix It, you can hit that subscribe button. And if you have any comments or complaints about the video, you can put those in the comment section below. And if you enjoyed this video, show it to your friends and share it around the internet. And maybe consider supporting the show on Patreon. See you next time for something not related to Star Trek. Probably.